All right, hello to my friends joining us via recording. Today is April 20th. We are doing one last lab review. This is the week of the lab final exam. So make sure we are carving out some time to take that exam. Here, I'm gonna pop up a poll for my friends here in class right now. I want to know, we're here on Monday. I wanna know, I hope we've given some thought to this, when we're planning to take our lab final exam. We need to have a plan because if we don't have a plan, the end of the week is gonna sneak up on us here. So my question is, I want to know what day of the week you are currently planning to take the lab exam. And for my half of you that haven't committed to a, to a time yet, um, let's pick one. Let's maybe get yourself a little bit of accountability here. Let's decide what day we think we might try to take the lab exam this week. Just a couple more of us left to vote. All right, well, I'll show you what I have so far. I have a good number of us who are planning to knock it out today. More power to you, that's great. Get it done, then we can start focusing on lecture stuff for this week, that's great. Uh, several of us are thinking Wednesday, Thursday timeline. <clears throat> several of us are also thinking Friday. Um, technically, you guys have until Saturday to take the exam. I strongly, strongly encourage you to try to take it sometime in the Wednesday, Thursday time frame. Because if you're planning to take it Wednesday, Thursday, and life happens and we get bumped by a day and we have to take it a day later, you still have time to take it. So uh, please don't plan to take it any later than Friday because if something happens on Friday, you are in crunch time on Saturday to make sure it gets done. So um, lots of friends planning to take it at different times. Um, yeah, you and you got that lab review assignment that's, that's open indefinitely. So use that as many times as you want and need to prepare. Um, but yeah, it looks like we've, we've got a plan. Most of us have a plan for when we might want to take this exam. Please don't, don't forget about the exam. Okay. So I'm going to close my poll really fast. One thing that I wanted to do with you guys, and I know this is totally just like a cartoon and, and a meme, right? But it's my life right now because I have my, my three-year-old, my toddler in my life. Um, this is a, what what some cartoonists said is going on inside the brain of a toddler. Now, I, I really like the, the things that they say is going on inside the toddler brain, but I don't like the places they put them. So we're gonna use this, um, this cartoon to help us remind ourselves of one of the things we need to know for the lab exam, and that is the location uh, of where we do various functions in the brain. So um, let's start with one that I do feel like it is not terrible, actually, where they put it. So the first thing they say that's going on inside a toddler brain, which is so very true right now um, for my daughter, is questions. So many questions. Um, when we talk about having questions or um, when we talk about conscious thought processes, um, things like your personality or, or how we think, um, that's going on in the frontal lobe. Of your brain so a lot of times when when you're thinking about what the frontal lobe does um, this is is the part of your brain I kind of like to think about it um, that really makes you you so uh, your personality let me change the color of my ink here your personality really comes from the frontal lobe your ability to plan so like the, the plan we just made for when we take our exam uh, that kind of higher order thinking and processing comes from the frontal lobe of the brain. The frontal lobe of the brain is also probably where this, this little mystery rage category comes from. Um, man, my daughter has her moments where it's like all of a sudden she is a volcano and she's real mad at me. Uh, that's going to come from this frontal lobe as well. So personality, a lot of emotion stuff. Hey, I know this is more of a lecture tie-in. But does anyone happen to remember what we um, what we called the emotional brain of you? There's a special name for for what is your 
as I, I put in quotes for you, the, the emotional brain. Where do emotions come from? Anybody remember what it's called? Uh, so the insula is, is an inner lobe, probably not quite emotional brain. Um, let me give you a hint. We, we called this emotional brain, yet yeah, involved the amygdala. It involved the olfactory, um, the olfactory bulbs. And the other th structure in it that we talked about was the hippocampus. All three of those structures together were part of something that we called the limbic system. The limbic system. The limbic system is, is your emotional brain. So emotional brain, the limbic system is, is kind of, if you remember from the lecture picture, it's all mixed up inside of here. I can't ask you to identify it in lab because there's not one structure that makes it up, but <clears throat> this mystery rage that, that we see inside my daughter and probably inside all of us, right? Uh, that's going to come from the limbic system. And at least some of that, that feeling of rage is, is coming from your frontal lobe here. This is one of my daughter's special talents right here up at the top. A sixth sense for when we're trying to relax so that she can find a way to prevent it. Um, although I don't know that she's actually trying to, to uh, pay attention to when we're trying to relax as much as like she just wants to always go. Um, so this, again, would be something that I might put in the category of this makes her very mischievous and it's kind of part of her personality. I would bump this little leader line up here. I'd probably put this one in the frontal cortex too. Hey, when we talk about hunger, um, this is when we're going to talk about that deep lobe in the middle of the brain that helps us to process taste sensations. What was that lobe of the brain that's found really deep in the middle of the brain? Does anyone remember? Lives inside here. Yeah, this is when that insula lobe comes back into play. So I would say that this hunger one, and of course it's snacks. This morning it was Cheez-Its. My daughter was on the Cheez-It train this morning. Like, heaven forbid we do Cheerios. Uh, heaven forbid we do a banana. It's got to be Cheez-Its. So uh, I would say hunger coming from the insula down deep. Okay, this one makes me really sad because, yeah, she's like me. I know. She, I, I, I say that I don't know where she got these things from. Let's be real. Um. It's very true that my daughter loves Daniel Tiger songs, but there is no way in the world that those Daniel Tiger songs are coming from this structure down here. What is the name of this structure? Let's start with the name of this structure down here. Can anyone tell from my picture? What part of the brain is this? Yeah, this is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is absolutely not doing anything about music. What does the cerebellum do? What does it help you with in your body? The function of the cerebellum in the body. What does the cerebellum do? Yeah, it checks things. The cerebellum is going to help us out with, um, yep, it's, it's a subconscious area. The cerebellum is going to be really important. Yeah, as Ariel's chiming in, that's, that's your balance center in the brain. So the cerebellum really helps out with balancing. Um, it, it looks at your movements and says, oh, you were trying to walk, not trying to drag your feet. Uh, I can fix that. I can make that help happen. So it's not going to be the place where she stores her Daniel Tiger songs. I drew a little line for us here. Um, yeah, well, that's true, actually, Mary Lou. Yeah, if she's doing the hokey pokey. It would help out with the hokey pokey. Um, I think those Daniel Tiger songs are more likely to be here in the temporal lobe where we do a lot of that hearing stuff. Remember the temporal lobe helps out with hearing. So I also added the farm animal sounds uh, to that area too, to hearing. They're definitely not coming from this part of the brain. This part of the brain has a bunch of different structures in it. This is the area called the brain stem. What did we say that big picture? What's the job of the brain stem? Big picture. Exactly, Lexi. Yeah, exactly. This is the part of, of you that keeps you alive. Now, I guess if, if farm animal sounds keep you alive, which maybe they do somewhere, um, we could store them here. But this is going to be more things like breathing, heart rate, reflexes, that kind of stuff. So 
just wanted to dissect this image a little bit because I love the ideas. It just makes me so sad on the inside where they put all their little flags. Like, come on, just do a little bit of, of basic anatomy reading and you got this, right? Like, you guys could have designed this better. And, and we have like 20 million other things that we're learning this semester, not just functions. So there's my little dissection of our, of our cartoon for the morning. Okay, so today is a lab review session. I have seen uh, a couple of things pop up in the chat for us to talk about today. I, ha I saw a request to talk about markings of the scapula, and I saw a request to talk about chest and shoulder muscles. What other topics do we want to talk about during our time today? Can you light up the chat for me with what other stuff we want to talk about? So far, I've got the scapula bone markings and chest and shoulder muscles. What else do we want to hear about? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I guess I'll turn my camera on for you, too. Got so excited to get started. To show you that I am in indeed not wearing pajamas. So... Oh, I'm getting crickets. I want to talk a little more about joints. Okay. Are there particular joints, parts of the body that, that we want to talk about, about joints in? Okay, so muscles of the lower limb. We can, we can talk through that reflex arc again. Yep. Okay, back and shoulder. Okay. So it looks like a lot of it is, is our last lab packet is what, it, what it's sounding like to me. Back and shoulder. Okay, want to review the sarcomere? Yep, we could do sarcomere. Uh, when you say movements, Carrie, what, are, are, what in particular are, are you meaning with movements? Um, are you meaning what the movement words mean or predicting movements? Or, or what do you specifically mean by that, Carrie? Uh, I can definitely hit on those structural classifications for sure. Structural neurons, predicting movements. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention, we kind of mentioned it on, uh, on Friday. Um, the good news about you taking the exam by yourself at home is that you can do all kinds of, of interpretive dances and nobody's going to see you doing those dances. So by all means, when we're thinking about trying to predict movements, um, the good news is you can look silly and you're not going to look silly for anybody except yourself. So, um, we can, um, yeah. So talking about how to predict movements, we, we can take a little bit of time to do that too. This is when it would be better for me to be in class with you. Right. Cause I, I would, I would look silly in front of you. I'll do the interpretive dance all day. Um, but we'll talk about how you can, can do those interpretive dances at, at home. Um, so predict movements. Um, Pam from, uh, from, from 12, uh, so we're talking about the, the meninges picture with the brain. Is, is that what you're talking about, Pam? I'm trying to interpret what you mentioned. Yeah. And Carrie, see the note about the, the muscles of, of the chest and shoulder. We'll talk a little bit about those guys. Yep. So Pam, if you can give me just a little more clarity, we got a pretty good list going on. Uh, so we're talking about the, the spinal cord inside the vertebrae then? Is, is that what you're talking about? Okay. Yep, we can go through and look at that one again. Yep, spinal cord in bone. Okay. Just to give you guys a heads up, um, I am sharing my, my webcam and my room with my husband again. He has to get on at 11.45. So um, heads up, I will be piecing out probably right at 11.30 today. Uh, but you can definitely still reach me if you have some questions that we don't get through. we got a, a long list today. So if there's some questions we don't quite get through that you still have, please feel free to, to email me today. And I'm going to try to catch up on emails and, and be as good as possible uh, about, about staying on top of stuff. So we had a lot of questions about um, the stuff from this week. So let me open up. Let's see. 
Oh, that's, nope, that's spinal cord. Okay. Uh, first thing we had questions about was this model. Well, the first thing that I'm hitting in my pictures was this model right here. So uh, let's briefly talk about this model. Um, so uh, when we're looking at this model here, let's do a, a couple of quick reminders for us. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. First thing to mention for you, when I'm looking at this model, and we talked about this this last week, when we're looking at this model, I can see some structures from the spinal cord, and I can also see some structures that are on the bone itself. So uh, this particular bone, we're looking at a vertebrae. Uh, in particular, does anyone remember which kind of vertebrae is, is this one here that my spinal cord is surrounded by? Yeah, so Pam remembers for us, this is one of our cervical vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae are the ones that are found at the top part of your neck. Remember, cervical uh, is on the top part of the neck. So there are a couple of ways that I know this one is cervical, and we want to make sure we know those, those ways. Yeah, so the first one Eileen already mentioned for us is this thing right here. This is a bone marking that we need to know on our cervical vertebrae. It is called a bifid spinous process. Bifid spinous process, meaning there are two parts to it. Bifid, two parts. All of my other vertebrae just have one part to their spinous process. So on the exam or on the homework assignment, if you see two parts on your spinous process, we know we're looking at a cervical vertebrae because cervical vertebrae have the two parts. So bifid spinous process, two parts, as opposed to just a spinous process with one part. That's my first thing on a cervical vertebra. The second thing that helps me to know this is a cervical vertebra are these two little holes right here, one and two. Now, on this model, they aren't just holes, right? On this model, we actually have blood vessels inside of them. But when you look at just a bone by itself, we call those holes the transverse foramen. Transverse foramen, meaning it's on the side. So the transverse foramen are little holes on the side of the vertebrae. Transverse foramen are holes for blood vessels. These are the blood vessels that go up to the brain. So I only see it in the vertebrae that are close to the brain. Got a couple of questions in uh, the chat about superior articular facet versus the superior articular process. Comes down to what these two words mean right here. A process is something that sticks up. Oh, I should not be writing this. We'll do it anyway. Sticks up. A facet is an indentation. So when I see things, for example, on the atlas, which is the very top cervical vertebrae that's flat, kind of like this, we've got this flat space that I would call a facet. When you're looking at a thoracic vertebra, for example, or a lumbar vertebra, when you look at them from the side, the parts, remember that I told you guys in office hours look like a moose or look like a giraffe. Uh, when we're talking about the parts that stick up so that that vertebrae can articulate with or connect to the vertebrae above it, that's a superior articular process. So the superior articular process is something that sticks up. Superior articular facets are going to be indentations or flat places where, where I form joints. So those facets help me to, to form joints that are, that are more flat. A process is when I have an inferior uh, articular process that meets with a superior one. So that's something we only see on, on those lower vertebrae, those processes. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, we're, we're on our cervical vertebra. We've got the bifid spinous process. We've got the two transverse foramen. Now we go into the model itself. Help me out in the chat. What's the name of the big hole right here that the spinal cord is found inside of? This whole big hole right here. 
Yes, a couple of us have chimed in. The really big hole is called the vertebral, if I can spell it right, the vertebral foramen. Make sure you know the difference, by the way, between a transverse foramen on the side and the vertebral foramen in the middle. Every single vertebrae has this big vertebral foramen. So the big vertebral foramen right here, the spinal cord is found inside of it. We had some issues on, on the lab homework assignment with labeling of our dura layers. So we're going to, or our, excuse me, our meningeal layers. So I'll, I'll make sure to help you out with that. Um, here's the first thing that I'll highlight for you. Let me zoom in a little bit more. As close as I can go. We have three layers of meninges. The first one I'm coloring blue right here. This one is touching the spinal cord. What's the name of the one that touches the spinal cord? Which meningeal layer touches the spinal cord? Yeah, that's the pia, the pia mater. So when you're looking at this model, when we're looking at the structures on it, the pia mater, that's the connective tissue layer that's attached to the spinal cord. The next layer that we see is this thin layer right here. I'm going to color it in red. And I can see it uh, down along here as well in red. It's this, this second outer layer. Sorry, I did a terrible job coloring it right there. The second layer is the spider web layer, the arachnoid mater. When we're looking at our model and when we're looking at a person that's alive, Right next to and right attached to that arachnoid mater is the dura mater. So again, terrible job here with coloring. It's labeled number nine right there, if, if that helps you on your lab packet. The dura mater is basically attached to the arachnoid mater on my model because uh, if you remember from the lecture packet, you saw labeled in, in there, it, it had something called the subdural space that I told you guys doesn't actually exist. There's not space between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. So they're attached to each other right close together. The pia mater is the one that's attached right close to the spinal cord. I know there was confusion on the homework, the way that it was labeled, um, mentioning this out here. This is just the connective tissue that I find between um, the cervical vertebra and this space in here which a lot of you mentioned to me in emails. Yes, we call this space right here the epidural space filled with adipose tissue. That's, that's a lecture word for us, epidural space. So uh, this right here is the epidural space, number 10, which means that this stuff here on the outside is connective tissue. It's not the, the dura mater. So I do apologize for that confusion. I will be uh, really honest with you. If I were labeling this model on the exam, really the best meningeal layer that I can see on here is the pia mater. Make sure we know where the pia mater is. Be familiar with where the arachnoid mater is. Um, honestly, I probably am not going to ask you, um, especially since we had some confusion on where the dura mater is, I'm not going to ask you on the exam where the dura mater is. I can ask you about the dura mater on that other model, the one that shows you the, the cross section with the brain. That's a much better one for me to ask you about the dura mater on. So consider that. Uh, we had a question about the subarachnoid space. Somebody help me out. Describe for me. Where do you find the subarachnoid space? Where is that one located? The subarachnoid space. Yeah, so good abbreviations here. It's, it's uh, under the arachnoid mater. It's between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Let me pick a color here. Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Wrong button. That was bound to happen. Uh, well, the good news is we can find it easily now because there's no other markings. See this space right here and this space right here? Labeled 13. That's the, the subarachnoid space. Underneath the structure that we had labeled as our arachnoid mater, this guy right here, and our pia mater that we had on the bottom right there. So the subarachnoid space is this stuff here in red. I believe it is labeled 13. I drew over it, but I believe it is labeled 13 right there. Any other last minute structures? 
on this one that we had a question about. Okay, not hearing anything in particular. I will mention we did talk about this in office hours on Friday too. So if you want to go through and get more stuff um, labeled, please feel free to check out um, our, our session from, from Friday. Um, let me see. Next thing I got a specific question on. Uh, okay, so Pilar wants to know about the spinal nerve. Um, let, let me give you some terminology and let's see if we can figure it out together. There are three nerves or three, three words related to spinal nerves that we need to know. We need to know roots. We need to know spinal nerve. We need to know ramus or rami when there's more than one. Which of these three words right here are the parts that is actually attached to the spinal cord? What's actually attached to the spinal cord? Is it the roots? Is it the spinal nerve? Or is it the ramus? What's directly attached to the spinal cord? Oh, it's good that we're asking about this because we're divided. Give me a few more votes. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so we're, we're divided. Uh, still about 50-50, which is perfect. Uh, all that because that gives me a chance to to help you guys out with something. When I ask about what's directly attached to the spinal cord, I'm asking about these guys right here. Here's one, and here's two right here. The things that are directly attached to the spinal cord are called the roots. The roots are directly attached. When my roots fuse together, so I see it right here where they fuse together, and I see it right here, where they fuse together. Where my roots fuse together, they form a spinal nerve, but my spinal nerves don't stay in one piece for very long. Um, yeah, so Eileen's pointing out the ganglion. Don't forget about this guy, right? That's how we know we're on the backside, so make sure we know that dorsal root ganglion. I form a spinal nerve where my two roots come together, that spinal nerve very quickly branches, which is literally what the word ramus means, branch, very quickly branches into a dorsal and ventral ramus. So here is my dorsal ramus going toward the back. Here is my ventral ramus going toward the front. So dorsal and ventral rami, the branches, that come off of my spinal nerve that is formed by my roots, the parts of, of a spinal nerve there for you. So roots come together, make a spinal nerve. We got a branch toward the back and a branch toward the front. Correct, Pilar, that's, that's where my, my spinal nerve starts. Technically, my spinal nerve actually also continues out this way too. So all of this could be considered the spinal nerve. Um, where I see those things coming together is right here. That's why I labeled it here. But technically, this would also be the spinal nerve, too. So all this right here, spinal nerve. All right. Next thing we had a question on was reflexes. We did not talk about reflexes on Friday. So I'll take a bit of time here to talk about reflexes. You guys know from lecture stuff now that when we talk about reflexes, these are ways that I connect together neurons where your brain's not involved in, in figuring out what we need to do to respond. So uh, for the most part, we're just using the spinal cord. We could also use the brain stem. We talked about some cranial reflexes last week, but for the sake of lab, we're just talking about our spinal reflexes here. When we talk about uh, spinal reflexes, we have three kinds of neurons that are involved. We have a sensory neuron that's detecting information from the environment. We have an interneuron that figures out what to do with that information. And we have a motor neuron that makes whatever we should be doing happen. The part of your body that, that we use to make something happen is this thing called an effector. 
when we talked about pretty much all the reflexes we talked about in lecture, our effectors were always skeletal muscle. So when I look at my model over here, this is a skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscles are typically going to be the effectors of, of a reflex arc. Okay, so let's go through and I'm gonna, gonna put some numbers here. Number one, number two, number three, number four. We just talked about what I would call structure number five. What is structure number five in the scheme of our labeling here? What would I call this muscle right here? What part of the reflex arc is this? Yes, this is this is going to be my effector, right? This is this is what has an effect that makes things happen. So this is the end of the line here where things happen. Structure number three, which is the specific kind of neuron that talks to my effector. What's structure number three? Yeah, that's that motor neuron because the motor neurons are the ones that can go out and talk to muscle tissue mostly. So I got my motor neuron here. That's an orange. My motor neuron got its directions from neuron number two. What would be the label I'd put here on neuron number two? What is what is this right here? Yeah, this is that interneuron, right? This is my processing neuron. And if you remember from our discussion in lecture, interneurons pretty much always live in the spinal cord for these reflexes. Some of them live in the brain stem, uh, but interneurons, here I'll make a note for us, interneurons always live in gray matter. There's electric correlation. Gray matter, whether it's in the middle of the spinal cord, whether it's gray matter in the brain or the brain stem. Remember that interneurons are processing neurons. Processing doesn't take a lot of myelin. Processing takes a lot of dendrites that can receive messages and funnel them together. So interneurons found in gray matter. My interneuron got its message from neuron number one right here. What kind of neuron is number one? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in. Neuron number one right here, this is my sensory neuron, neuron number one. That sensory neuron, hey, here, here's a big tip off for me. Look at this big bump that it lives inside of. What's the name of this big bump that this lives inside of? Yes, yeah, we talked about this hours, the easiest way to abbreviate it, DRG, dorsal root ganglion. That is an absolutely must know. We gotta know that one on the spine, spinal cord. This bump here on the backside, that's the dorsal root ganglion. And the type of neuron that lives back there are those sensory neurons. Now, if I track with my sensory neuron all the way up here to where it's collecting sensory information from the skin, that's my structure number four. Let me zoom in to show you. If you zoom in really close, you can see uh, all of my dendrites on this neuron. Some of them have this little green area on them, little green area, but also branches that stick up right here. All of these little portions right here, what would be the dendrites on a typical neuron, uh, all the little portions that I see right here are my receptors, where I receive sensory information. So receptors, the last part of the reflex arc that we're labeling, technically it's <clears throat> the first part of your, receptor, your reflex arc that we have to, to use. Um, so here's my receptors that are attached to that sensory neuron that sends its information to the interneuron. The interneuron figures out what with it and tells the motor neuron what we should be doing. Motor neuron tells the effector and gets it done. Now, this is a good model for us to, uh, well, so Pilar asked, the reflex arc is, is in the gray matter. The reflex arc is all of this, it's everything. So an arc goes from where you determine sensory information to where you make something happen. Um, that's, that's what a reflex arc is. So the processing all happens in the gray matter, but the arc uses all, all these, different, these different parts. <coughs> Excuse me. We had a question about neuron structural classifications. 
And this is actually a really good model for us to use to talk about those structural classifications. First, let's uh, make a list for ourselves here. When we talk about structural classifications, structural classifications means it's classified based on, on its shape. So um, when we talk about being based on its shape, uh, we are going to use what's called a polar word. That's the way I like to, to call them, polar words. Now, it's not the same as polar and nonpolar uh, in the way that, that um, we used it at the beginning of the semester. What I mean by the polar words for structural classification is going to be unipolar, yes, as Mary Lou piped in, or bipolar, or that's going to be multipolar. These are my options here for structural classifications. Hey, by the way, let's do a quick review. This is structural classifications. We also can have functional classifications. If I wanted to do functional classifications, what are the three functional classifications? Not structural anymore. What's the functional classifications? Yep, so sensory is that first one. It's all the stuff we just filled in, right? Sensory, motor, neurons. Okay, so wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Read your questions when you're taking the exam. Read them slowly. Am I asking you for a structural classification, which is a polar word, or am I asking you for a functional classification, what it does? So keep that in mind. Read the question slowly. It, pretend like you had the ex exam packet in front of you, right? And underline, highlight, star, whichever word in your mind, right? Because it's on the computer. Uh, whichever word we ask you for to help you know, am I looking for something that's polar? Or am I looking for how it how it functions? Okay, so we want to do structural classifications. Structural classifications come from the number of, of parts that stick off of my cell body. So uh, the number of extensions or like I said, parts that come off of the cell body is where these, these beginning parts right here, uni, bi, and multi come from. Most of the neurons in your body are multipolar. Most of them are multipolar. In my picture here, can we identify any neurons that are multipolar and multipolar neurons? Yeah, my interneuron. Here's one of those multipolar neurons that I see right here. And the other one, like Eileen chimed in, is my motor neuron right here. When you look at a multipolar neuron, these are going to be neurons that have the cell body with an axon that comes off and then has all of its little dendrites that are coming off of that cell body as well. This is the shape of a very typical multipolar neuron. And I can see that right here and I can see that right here, multipolar. Hey, this neuron right here, what do I call the structural classification of this one? What kind of neuron is this one right here? Can we tell? Yeah, so this is what we call a unipolar neuron. A unipolar neuron is going to look a little bit more like this. And we can see it in our model, too. Unipolar neurons have one part, let me change colors right here, one part that comes off of their cell body. So that one part, you can see it right there in the image, one part. When we were talking about structural functional classifications, we said that unipolar neurons are always sensory neurons. So there's another tip off for us that this is a unipolar neuron because it is a sensory neuron that we see on the back side of the spinal cord. So unipolar neuron with one extension coming down, multipolar neurons that have more than extension coming down. Could you turn on the fan? Thank you. My, my husband came in to save you guys from the baby monitor. I realized as he and my daughter were in her bedroom that I forgot to turn it off. So hooray for him. <laughs> okay, so we've seen unipolar right here. We've seen multipolar right here. 
The one that we haven't seen on our, our structural classification is what we call bipolar. So let me draw you a little bipolar neuron. Before I draw it, bi means I'm going to have how many things coming off of that one? Bipolar. Yeah, bi means two. So I'm going to have my little, uh, my, my dendrites over here. I'm going to have my cell body in the middle. And then I'm going to have my axon that takes stuff away. This is what a bipolar neuron looks like. Bipolar neurons, uh, we're not really going to talk about much uh, this semester at all because we didn't do special senses in lab. Uh, bipolar neurons are used in special senses, special senses. So this is the kind of neuron that you're going to learn about uh, very briefly in lecture this week um, as it relates to the types of cells in the retina inside the eyeball, for example. So structural classification, unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. Functional classification, sensory, motor, interneurons. Any other questions about this model or about those structural classifications? Or I suppose we could host our first dance party. If, if we're feeling pretty good, give me, give me a dance party here. Oh, penguin party. There we go. I like that. <coughs> Got some dancing going on. Um, if it's related to lecture homework, Pilar, let's save it to the, for the end of, of our, our time together today, if that's all right. Uh, okay, so if, if it's a lab homework question, go ahead and type it back up for me and we can, we can address it. Okay, so we're talking about the reflex arc, yep. What about, about the reflex arc with, with white and gray matter? Uh, yeah, so if we if we look at our model here, where are we seeing um, most of the components of our reflex arc then? If, if we're looking at that just the spinal cord part of it, yeah, when, when we're talking about the, the parts, when we're in the spinal cord, um, primarily the parts of the reflex arc that are in the spinal cord are in the gray matter. They're not in the white matter because that's where the tracts are found. Um, they, they would involve the gray matter of the spinal cord. But uh, uh, yeah, so so think about that as as which parts when it's the parts that are in the spinal cord, which kind are they in? Well, I don't see any of them out here in the in the tracks because the tracks take stuff up or down. So yes, we would say that reflexes uh, involve the gray matter of the spinal cord, not the white matter of the spinal cord. All right, I had next thing in my my list of pictures here that I had questions about were was the scapula. Um, help me out. What are some of the scapula structures that we most want to review? Because I probably won't go through and do everything. What are some of the structures that we're most interested in reviewing? And you can abbreviate because I know some of them have a long, a long name. Okay, chromium versus coracoid process. Yeah, that's a good, important one. We can start there. Let's start with that. Uh, the acromion and the coracoid process are these two structures right here. Here's one and here's two. Uh, I can only see them right here and I can see the other one when I, when I turn to the side. Um, so when I'm looking at the, the two, uh, I can see both of them right here. This is called the anterior view, meaning if I look straight through you, behind your rib cage. Uh, this is the part, by the way, so this right here, this flat part, is the part that would be touching your ribs. Uh, if I looked through you and I looked at the two points that stick up in your shoulder, I need to be able to identify whether it's the coracoid process or the acromion. We said in um, our discussion of the scapula, which of those structures, let's see if we remember, is it the coracoid process or the acromion that is attached to the spine of the scapula? 
which one is at the end of the spine? At the end of the spine is the coracoid process or chromium? Yep, a chromium. A chromium. Okay. So when I'm looking at, I know we started on our, our anterior view here. Uh, I'm actually going to bounce this back over to our posterior view because on the posterior view, you can see the spine really well. Here's the spine of the scapula. At the very end of the spine of the scapula is the acromion. So I can see the acromion. I guess you can technically see a little bit of the coracoid process right here. Um, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm not going to ask you to identify the coracoid process in this view. This is not the best view for the coracoid process. But here it is sticking up right there. The acromion is much easier to see here at the end of the spine. But let's go back over then to our picture from the front side of the body, if I'm looking through you. The acromion, we said, is the one that's attached to the spine of the scapula. And the spine is on the very back of the scapula. That's your shoulder blade that you feel. Here's the acromion, the bigger one here in the back, the acromion. Here is that coracoid process sticking out toward the front. So the acromion, always remember this, that the acromion is the one that's attached to the spine. When we're looking at the scapula, if I see the spine, I know that the acromion's there at the end. If I see this view where there's not a spine along the back, that tells me, oh, I'm looking at the scapula from the front. I'm looking through me to see this bone. That means the first one I'm going to bump into is the coracoid process because that's on the front. So let's go to the side view to help us out with these two, and then we'll go back to some other structures here. When I look at the scapula from the side view, let me get my, my back here. Here is my, my indentation that would be up against the rib cage. The way I know that is because see this big, I'm going to circle the entire projection right here. This big entire projection that I see right here, this is where I find both the spine and the acromion. Because this side right here is flat. This whole, whole region is flat. This part sticks out. So this is my spine of my scapula back here, and my acromion is going to be with it. Since this is the side that reaches toward the front, that means that right here, this branching part that goes toward the front, that's my coracoid process, which makes this part right here that I'm looking at, this extension, that's the, the acromion. And the spine, I can see right here, and it would continue. I know we can't see it, but remember, when we look from the other angle, that's going to continue if I could somehow show you back along the rest of, of the bone there. So the spine of the scapula sticking out here. The acromion, the projection that, that's, that's off of it, the coracoid process, the part that I see right here. Uh, let me pull up the chat because I know I had a couple. Um, so we had some questions about the supraglenoid tubercle, and I know I answered some emails about the infraglenoid tubercle. Check this out. Supra, infra. What would supra mean? Supra, yeah, above, on, on the top, something that is superior, supra. Uh, this glenoid word right here comes from the bone marking called the glenoid cavity. Hopefully we're all very familiar with the glenoid cavity. That's this big space right here. It's, it's where your humerus goes inside of. So here's my glenoid cavity. I need to find the supraglenoid tubercle. Hey, this would be a good time for us to go back to that last packet before the midterm exam where we sorted bone marks. A tubercle is something that sticks out or some kind of projection. I'm looking for some kind of projection that is above the glenoid cavity, supraglenoid tubercle. Hey, not a trick question. Infraglenoid tubercle. Infra means it's going to be found, yeah, below. Exactly. Okay, so here we go. I've got my glenoid cavity right here. Let me switch colors. Up above the glenoid cavity, I've got this little lip up here. I've got a projection that sticks out. This one is above the glenoid cavity. 
So which one is this projection or this little lip going to be? Which one is that? Yeah, that's supra, right? It's above. So my supraglenoid tubercle right here. Notice I've got this nice big bump right here down below the glenoid cavity. It's below, so its technical name is infra, exactly, infraglenoid. So the infraglenoid tubercle is the bump below the glenoid cavity. The supraglenoid tubercle is the bump above the glenoid cavity. Can we go over the fossas? Yes. Um, so uh, here's another one that would be a good one to uh, reference back to that last packet before the midterm. A fossa means an indentation. So we have uh, two fossas we can see on this picture, and we'll go back to another picture to see the third one. Uh, one of the fossas we have is the infraspinous fossa. Hey, not a trick question. You guys already told me infra means below. Spinous means I'm going to be below what? Yeah, Eileen mentioned it for me. Below the spine of the scapula. Remember, the spine of the scapula is right here. Infraspinous fossa is the technical name for the flat space that is below the spine of the scapula right here. Infraspinous fossa. We also have the subscapular fossa. Sub also means below, but this time we're talking about the entire bone itself. So the subscapular fossa is this side of my bone. It's the flat part that we said rested against your rib cage, the subscapular fossa. So uh, let me, I'll type for us here. Infraspinous is on the outside underneath the spine. Subscapular is underneath the entire scapula. So, so that's, that's what all basically the entire front surface of the scapula is the subscapular fossa. If we go back to our posterior view, we can also see that there is a supraspinous fossa. The supraspinous fossa is the indentation up here above the spine. The infraspinous fossa is the indentation here, down below the spine. We cannot see the subscapular fossa when we look at the, spot, uh, the scapula from the back. We can only see it when we look at it from the front, and it's this entire space right here, the entire space here, the subscapular fossa. Any other scapula? bone markings that we had a question about or give me a thumbs up if we're feeling better about the scapula and I, I've mentioned this several times before I'll say it again um, we're going to pick the best picture to help you see these things for so what I mean by that is if I'm gonna ask you about the supraspinous fossa or the infraspinous fossa I'm gonna ask you on this picture because this is where it's the easiest to see. If I'm going to ask you about the spine, I'm going to ask you on this picture here. If I'm going to ask you about the coracoid process, I'd probably use this one right here because this is where I can see it the most clearly. So I know that we have you label structures on more than one picture, but we are going to, to pick for you the best possible picture to see these things on. So the spine, easiest to see on, on this picture, not, not as easy to see in the lateral view. What's great on the lateral view is this big, huge glenoid cavity. That big, huge glenoid cavity, I can see really well there. I can see that infraglenoid uh, tubercle really well on this one. Um, so, so think about what structures you can see best on each of the images. I promise you we're, we're not trying to trip you up. We're trying to find the best picture for you to help you find these structures. All right, let me pull up see what's next probably our muscles okay so let me pull up muscle guy back view to see some of the new muscles and to see a whole lot of old muscles wink wink nudge nudge that this is great review for you 
to go through and find all of, of these muscles. Um, so please use this as a good review and a check for yourself. These ones are the newer ones this week, and this is the ones that we already had talked about. Are there any muscles that we're having a really hard time finding? Or give me a thumbs up if we okay. Okay, location of the deltoid. We can talk about deltoid. Hey, help me out for location of the deltoid. Um, if you were to describe it on you, where do you find your deltoid muscle? Yeah, Eileen is mentioning this is this is the, the shoulder muscle, the top of the shoulder muscle. The deltoid muscle is one that's named based on its shape. Yeah, it's the location of in injections. Great way to remember it, Vanessa, absolutely. The deltoid muscle is named based on its shape. It's a triangle. It's a delta. Um, so the deltoid muscle, we're looking for a triangle that lives on top of the shoulder. I can see the triangle right here. I can see the triangle right here. It is the muscle, like, like Vanessa mentioned for us, this is where when you get an intramuscular injection, when you get your flu shot, right, this is where they put it into your arm is into that deltoid muscle. So there's the deltoid muscle for us. Yeah, painful shots, right? Yep. Okay, so fibularis longus. Um, with, with that one, I'll mention to you, and, and we put it in parentheses for you, when you're looking at labeled resources, a lot of times they like to call it peroneus. Uh, it's one of those with two names. Um, I really like this name better because it tells me where I'd find it. Fibularis longus. Um, what bone do we think that's going to be by? Fibularis longus. That's going to be by the fibula. Yep. So fibularis longus is going to be by the fibula. Let me zoom in. Does the fibula live on the outside or the inside of your leg which side is the fibula on medial or lateral yeah fibula is on the lateral side it's on the outside so uh fibularis longus is going to be my muscle that i see i'm going to draw on it here so i'm just going to completely black it out see this muscle right here on the outside by by the fibula fibularis longus the one that lives on the very outside it goes down into the foot. So fibularis longus, I can only see it on this leg. I mean, I guess you can see the beginnings of it. I'll point it out here. You can kind of see part of it right here too. Um, so fibularis longus, technically I can see it on this side too. Um, again, big thing to know about that is it's found right on top of where the fibula would be. We have fibularis longus. Then we have, let's go to the very back of your leg. What's the name of the calf muscle in the very back of your leg? Yeah, this, this one back here, I always like to joke, this is the muscle that, ladies, we uh, show off in heels. Gastrocnemius, that's what we're trying to show off, is the gastrocnemius. That's the muscle that lives here in the very back. So gastrocnemius muscle right here. And right in front of gastrocnemius is this little one right here. This little one right here that's right in front of gastrocnemius that I did a terrible job circling is soleus. Yep, soleus. Okay, so let me erase and I'll just point. So I'm going to get rid of my markings here. Gastrocnemius in the very back. It's the most posterior right in front of it is the soleus muscle and on the side where the fibula is that's peroneus or the way that that we like to call it fibularis longus it's on the fibula side on the outside uh, i know i saw a question about biceps femoris uh, help me out in the chat biceps femoris would we say that that is a lateral muscle or a medial muscle it's found in the thigh. I'll give you that, that hint there. Biceps femoris. Ooh, I'm glad we're talking about this one. There's two options here. One and two. Is it one or two? Which one is biceps? Number one or number two? Biceps femoris. Ah. All my messages got hidden. Go back to it. 
Yes. Yeah, when I label them one and two, we got it. So it's probably just a terminology problem here. Number one, muscle number one on the outside. This is biceps femoris. And as Carrie mentioned for us, good one to make sure we know, this muscle here in the middle is semitendinosus. So semitendinosus is medial, biceps femoris is lateral on the outside. So we switch over here. I'm on the medial one right here. What was the name of the medial one again? What's this one here in the middle? Yep, that's semitendinosus. And the next door neighbor, the one on the outside, is biceps femoris. So biceps femoris there on the outside. And again, we've got gastrocnemius that I can see right here. We can kind of see scolius right in front of it. Again, kind of. And then there's fibularis longus right, right over there as well. Since semimembranosis was not one that we ask you to label, um, no, we're not going to ask you to identify it. Uh, it. It doesn't mean that we won't ask you what it does because we did ask you to predict its action. We did not ask you to find it. Um, let me see if I can show it to you. Yeah, I can't zoom in anymore. Um, here, let me clear my stuff and show you. This little thing right here, that would be semimembranosis. Um, this little section right here would be semimembranosis. It lives right next door um, to, to semitendinosis. They live, they're next door neighbors. I'm not going to ask you to identify it because it's so small. Um, but yes, we, we, so just know that semitendinosis and I'll, I'll put its name here in our list, semimembranosis. We can ask you what semimembranosis does, but I'm not, cause I'd have to, I'd have to zoom in so close to ask you to identify this little tiny guy right here. So semimembranosis right here. We, we don't have to know its location. We do need to know semitendinosis, definitely. We do need to know biceps femoris, definitely. Yeah, it does the same thing as semitendinosis. That's correct, because they live right next to each other. Absolutely. I know that somebody asked, um, let me pull it up really fast. So, well, and multiple of us asked about, about actions. So let's, um, well, those are leg muscles, so that's in another one. Um, let's make some notes for ourselves. I'm, I'm going to whiteboard it, I think, here. So um, let's go to a whiteboard. And we're going to talk about actions. Okay, we zoom back out. Muscle actions. When we talk about uh, make predictions. When we talk about muscle actions, I don't want you guys to um, I, I don't want you guys to memorize actions. I want you guys primarily to make predictions for those actions. Now we have to to, to be able to make predictions on actions um, for what we're doing. Yeah, like Eileen said, we have to know the rules. So the rules tell me if a muscle lives on the anterior side or it lives on the posterior side or um, it lives on the lateral or medial side. Here's what it does. Um, these are things that we have to know the location of muscles for first. So for you to be able to make predictions, number one, we must know locations. We must know the locations of muscles. So if you're trying to figure out, because I know all of us, right, here, here comes sarcasm, just to make sure we all know this is sarcastic. I know all of us are sitting at home and doing nothing, and we have all the time in the world on our hands, right? That's sarcasm, for the record. Um, if you're trying to figure out what would be a high yield um, something to be working on right now, first thing that we need to do for this exam is really make sure we know our muscle locations, right? We've got to know where, where those muscles are found. Once we know the muscle locations, then we can use those locations to make predictions. So then we need to know rules. So the rules for different parts of the body are different. Um, we're, let's go through and we'll outline some of those different rules uh, because we, we need to make sure we're keeping the rules straight in, in our mind. So some of the things that we need to know, uh, we need to know about muscles that move the femur. We'll do the femur. 
muscles that move the tibia and the fibula. I think they're grouped together. Mostly the tibia. Uh, muscles that move the humerus. Who can't spell? Muscles that move the radius and ulna. <clears throat> And then I don't have enough space to do it nicely, so I'm put my hand. Move the hand. Okay. <clears throat> I believe these are the main locations that we, we made you guys know movement rules on. So uh, first thing we got to know is we need to know the muscles that attach to each of these bones. So this is where looking at the front and the back and the side and all those different views of muscle man, or you guys know how much I love Google Images, right? So pull up Google Images and make sure we know the locations of muscles. First, we know that. We need to know that biceps brachii isn't going to move the femur, right? Biceps brachii is going to help me to move the radius and the ulna. So we need to know where the muscles are found on the body. That's the first place to start there is know where they're found. Once I know where they're found, now we need to start talking about actions. So let's start with the radius and the ulna, because this is the one that's easiest for us to act out. Um, so again, I told you guys, and we've talked about in office hours, nobody can see you right now. Dr. Aulis is the only one on the webcam today, so nobody can see you. As we start talking about these actions, please, please act them out, because it's gonna help you with your studying if we can act them out. So let's talk about moving the radius and the ulna. Moving the radius and the ulna is what you do when you go to the gym. Let me adjust my camera here. And I've got a weight in my hand, and I pull that weight up. And then I lift that weight down slowly. When I'm pulling my weight up, so when I'm doing this with a weight in my arm, so this movement right here, what do I call this movement right here? What did I just do? Going from a straight line to this. Yes. This movement is called flexion. Okay, first thing I can do is I can flex the radius and the ulna. Yeah, flexion means that I decrease the angle, uh, or in other words, I decrease the distance between the two bones that we're talking about. So I'm, I'm pulling my radius and my ulna closer to my humerus. This joint, my elbow joint, gets smaller. I decrease the angle. When you do this movement, we could either memorize the rules or you can literally, you've got your body, right? You have your body for the, the final exam. I can put my hand on the top side. When I pull this up, I can feel the movement in the muscle right here on the top side of my arm. Now, our muscle movement rules don't talk about the top side and the bottom side of our arm. They talk about anterior and posterior. And this is when you have to go back to and remember anatomical position. Remember, anatomical position is super awkward. You stand up straight. You put those palms forward in front of you. Things that I see on the front side of you when you're in anatomical position, we call those anterior. Things that I see on the back side of you when you're in anatomical position are called posterior. So, <coughs> excuse me. When I am talking about the muscles, that helped me to flex the radius and the ulna to do this movement that we just talked about, flexing the radius and the ulna. I'm talking about this guy right here. This is biceps brachii. Would we say biceps brachii is on the front or on the back? Which side is biceps brachii on? Exactly. Yeah, it's on the front side. Or to be more technical, right, to be more correct, the way that our rules phrase it, we would say that's the job of an anterior muscle, an anterior muscle. When I'm bringing the radius and the ulna back down, uh, I'm doing the opposite movement called extension. So when I extend the radius and the ulna, here's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's going to be done by muscles on the opposite side of the body. Remember we talked about the idea of antagonists. That's muscles that are that do the opposite action that are on the other side of the bone or the other side of the body. Yeah, so so that particular music, uh, movement, 
the opposite is the triceps muscle. And the triceps muscle lives on the posterior side, the posterior side of the arm. We just used our body right here. We just felt our arm. So when I brought it up, I felt contraction here on the front. When I brought it back down, contraction happens on the back side. I used my own body, feeling my body parts, to come up with these two rules right here. If you don't want to use your body to come up with the rules, then just memorize these rules right here. As long as you've got your rules memorized, you know if it's flexion or extension. Or as a fail safe, you've got your own body to use, right? Okay. Um, I think Eileen mentioned for me, was it for the radius and the ulna question that it also talked about lateral? Or was that one more for moving the hand? I know we talk about, yeah, so sometimes it does talk about um, lateral. Yeah, the rules do sometimes mention lateral and medial. Not particularly for radius and ulna, uh, but we do mention lateral medial when it comes to the hand. So when we're talking about moving the hand, we actually have to talk about uh, two groups of, of movements that the hand can do. So the hand can do flexion, which is what we do if everybody, I, I would have you if you were in class together, right? We'd all put our hand up and I would say, okay, we all need to, you all need to dismiss me, right? Pasha, we just flexed. So going from your hand straight up to your hand bent down, that's flexion. Bringing that hand back up is extension. So the first thing we need to know with movements of the hand, we need to know flexing the hand and extending the hand. When I do flexion of the hand, I need my hand to come closer to my radius and my ulna. When you do that movement, and again, I would encourage you to do it on yourself because I can't see you, right? Your classmates can't see you. When you do this movement right here, the muscles that live on this side of your hand do that movement. They pull the hand down, pull it closer together. That means that my muscles that do flexion of the hand, is flexion of the hand going to be anterior or posterior? Think back to anatomical position. Is this anterior or posterior right here? Can we tell? Yeah, this is anterior. Anterior. If you live on the front side of the forearm, that's what this space is called, the forearm, um, you're going to flex the hand. You're going to bring the hand closer to the radius and the ulna. Yeah, so Carrie pointed out the one big one. Remember that I told you guys our reference one, palmaris longus. That's going to be a big one that does flexion, flexing it down, pulling it down. We also have those two, which we should all really love these two because they're awesome, right? flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis. Oh, please, oh, please do not tell me the flexors do extension. Oh, please, oh, please don't tell me that. I will cry. I will know that I have failed you as a teacher. Please don't make me fail, right? You've worked too hard. I've worked too hard. We, we know that, right? Flexors, they do flexion. They live on the front side. Extensors then do extension. We have extensor muscles, right? Yeah, quit and go to another school, right? <laughs> if there'd be another school that would have me, I, it would just be, it's kind of like when we were doing office hours last week and we had the ALS article up, right? And I told you guys that I was really glad you knew what the tongue was and you knew what the foot was. Um, it, it's little things like that, right? So um, yeah, I'm glad that that we're, we're all agreeing. We're not gonna say that the flexor muscles here do extension. I'm glad we all agree on that. So extension is done by my muscles that live on the posterior side, that live on the back side. Extensor muscles extend. So I'm showing you from the side now. When I'm flexed down, here's when I'm flexed, I extend back up like this. I can actually, it's called hyperextend my wrist. So when you put your wrist backwards, that is when you can most feel these muscles back here that actually do the process of extension. So posterior muscles do extension, they pull backwards. Anterior muscles do flexion. They pull it forward. By the way, the extensor muscles that we're knowing back here, the big one in the middle was extensor digitorum, right? And then we had extensor carpi radialis, extensor carpi ulnaris. So 
they've got big long names, but the nice thing about their names is it tells me which of the movements that they do for me, flexion and extension. Now, so they flex, yeah, they, they do, Eileen. Yeah, well, just for you, for your exam, Eileen, your particular exam, we will say that, that these extensors back here do flexion. How about that? So for the record of my friends on the recording, that, that was sarcasm again, just to make sure we know. <laughs> All right, um, two more movements that the hand can do. Uh, the, mo the other two movements the hand can do is called abduction and adduction. Abduction and adduction is, is what you do when you, you flick your wrist, wrist up or flick your wrist down. Um, this is going to be super hard to show. Let me see if I can get my skeleton friend to help me out here. Okay. Here I am with a skeleton friend. When I take my wrist joint and I kind of bend it up, his wrist joint is terrible. Uh, so imagine that his wrist joint is bending up and away. That's abduction. When his wrist joint is bending toward the middle, that is adduction. Um, yeah, so abduction means we're moving away from the middle of the body. Adduction means we're moving toward. Remember, we use the example in class that you can do this with your hands. So when I put all my fingers together, uh, I spread them out. That's abduction away from the middle of my hand, and I adduct them back together. When we talk about doing this with your wrist, this is no longer the job of just front versus back. Now this is the job of lateral versus medial. And I promise when we're predicting um, abduction, adduction, it, it just makes sense in your body. If a muscle lives on the outside of you, so it lives somewhere on this outside part, the lateral part of you. The muscles that live on the lateral part, the outside of you, when they contract and get shorter, when they squeeze, you go up, you abduct. So it's always going to be if you live on the lateral side, you are always an abductor. Lateral is always abduction. Because if I live on the outside, I always pull up. If I live on the inside, if I live in, in the middle, I'm always going to pull down. I'm always going to pull things medially. So think about the definition of abduction versus adduction. Abduction means I'm going away from the midline. I have to live away from the midline to be able to pull you that way. Adduction, going back toward the midline, again, I've got to live by the midline to be able to do that kind of movement. So uh, I noticed, let me go back to the chat, somebody mentioned, um, Flexor carpi radialis, correct. Um, with, with, there's just two muscles that we ask you to know abduction, adduction on, and that's flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. These two muscles, when you put them side by side, the lateral one is radialis on the radius side. The medial one is medialis, or excuse me, is ulnaris on the medial side. So just know in, in general, this is true whether we're talking about um, moving the hand. We do abduction and adduction with the femur. Uh, we also do it with the humerus. So abduction, adduction, if you live on the outside, you're going to do abduction. If you live on the inside, in the middle, you're doing adduction. You're adding things back together. Um, Pam asked about pronate and supinate. You do not have to know pronate and supinate. So at this point in the semester, since you don't have to know it, um, don't focus on it. If you want to do a little supplemental reading about pronate and supinate, you can. Um, but we're not requiring you to know those actions. Uh, brachioradialis is, is going to be one that assists with the movement of the radius and the ulna carry. Um, so that one, we, we're going to go based on where it attaches. Where it ends up attaching is down here in the forearm, on the front side of the forearm which makes that one a flexor. So brachioradialis does flexion, but it doesn't go all the way down as the hand. That one doesn't help with moving the hand. That one moves the radius and the ulna. Bear with me, I'm gonna blow my nose really fast. All right, we've got the rules for the radius and the ulna and the hand. Uh, let's do the humerus really fast as well. 
uh, the humerus is going to match up with our rules about the radius and the ulna. So with the humerus, when we're talking about flexion, that's pulling your humerus forward when your arm comes forward like you're bowling. That's still going to be anterior. And when we talk about extension, that is going to be my posterior muscles. They're going to pull toward the backside. That's where, where extension happens is going toward the backside of the body. The humerus can also do abduction and adduction. Again, think about the way we were discussing it. For me to be able to pull a muscle toward the outside of the body, I've got to live on the outside. I got to be lateral. For me to be able to pull a muscle toward the inside of the body, I've got to live medial, more toward the middle. So abduction, really there, there's one muscle that's most responsible for the abduction of your arm. Can we guess what muscle is most responsible for doing this movement right here? And if you've ever done this with weights, right, you feel it pretty fast. What muscle helps us to abduct the humerus? Yeah, this guy right up here. The main abductor is the deltoid. Deltoid, and it's found on the lateral side. Adduction then, pulling it back down. This is going to be a lot of your back muscles. So big one is latissimus dorsi. Big one, latissimus dorsi. Um, but so primarily, we wouldn't really say latissimus dorsi. You, you could kind of say that it's medial um, in the sense that it attaches to the medial part of the humerus to pull it back down. Uh, but it's also found on, on the posterior side of the body, closer to the middle of the body than the deltoid muscle that lives here on top. So big adductor is latissimus dorsi. Big abductor is the deltoid pulling it up. Okay, here's our rules for the humerus, the radius and the ulna, and the hand. Here's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You do want to make sure you know which of these particular parts muscles in the body move. So we want to know that biceps brachii that lives right here, this muscle doesn't move the humerus. What moves the humerus are the muscles that live in the shoulder and the back. What this muscle, biceps brachii, moves is the stuff in your forearm, so the radius and the ulna. And we want to know that the stuff that lives in the forearm doesn't move the radius and the ulna, it's moving the hand. So make sure we know which parts of the body things move. That's a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge for us. Make sure we, we know which parts we move. Now, things get a little bit crazy when we start talking about the leg. Yeah, so Pam asked, does that go for the leg? Yes, it does go for the leg. Um, and in the leg, it's kind of a special case. So we need to talk a little bit about the leg here. First thing to know with the leg is that the two, two, two places we're learning movements for are the femur, the big femur bone, and the tibia. Now, when the tibia moves, the fibula moves with it, so we're, we're grouping them together. All these rules that we learned for, for the arm, to some extent, we basically throw them out the window when we're talking about moving the femur. The femur, the way that it moves is actually kind of opposite, or the orientation, the directions it moves, is opposite uh, compared to what the arm does. So what I mean by that is when you think about normally moving your leg, um, flexing your leg, it, it's still... It still moves it forward, but maybe what feels so natural in, in the arms as flexion feels a little bit less natural in, in the legs, especially as it pertains to the tibia. So you're sitting down right now, I presume, or some of us are probably uh, lounging right now. Uh, but I want you to try to uh, put your leg at a 90 degree angle. Let's get my skeleton friend here. He's a little bit, a little bit mixed up. Okay. I'm sitting here at a 90 degree angle. When I talk about movements of the tibia and the fibula, we're gonna start down here in the bottom half. When I do movements of the tibia and the fibula, here I am at 90 degrees. Tell me what I would call this movement. What movement did I just do? So I'll show you again, here I am. This movement right here. Yes, 
So we're also pointing out for me the movement I just did where I take the tibia or the bottom part of the leg and I make it straight. I call that movement extension. Okay, so we're going to start here with the tibia and the fibula. And we're going to start with extension. Extension is when you make your legs straight. Yes, we're increasing the angle. Technically what extension means. So going from your legs at 90 degrees to straightening it out completely, that movement is called extension. When I do extension, when I pull my leg straight, get it com completely flat, the muscles that help me to do extension of the tibia, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you this one. We're going to talk our way through this one. These are the muscles that live on the anterior thigh. The front side of your thigh, the anterior thigh. And again, if you're sitting up at a chair, please do extension and feel the top of your thigh. You can feel some movement in the muscles as you extend extend your, your leg there. So muscles that extend the tibia and the fibula, which means brings them flat. Those are the muscles that live on the anterior or the front of your thigh. If I go back to my skeleton friend here, when he's all extended, now when I bring that back down, I'm doing flexion. Remember, flexion, the angle gets smaller. So we're all the way out here. When I do flexion and bring it back down, that angle got smaller. So when I talk about flexion, flexion of the tibia, emula, this is the work of the posterior thigh muscles. The muscles that live on the back side of the thigh. So posterior and anterior were a little bit flipped from what we've been before. That's why I said it's a special case when it comes to the, the fibula. What's going on at your knee joint? The knee joint is backwards. Thank you, anatomy, for, for being backwards. So muscles that extend the tibia, meaning pull your leg out straight, those guys live on the front. Muscles that flex the tibia, pulling it back down, they live on the back side. When we talk about moving the femur, we like the femur better than the tibia and the fibula because the femur matches our rules from before. So when we talk about the femur, when we say talk about flexing the femur, so here I am, oh, his poor leg. Hey, fun fact, confession to not tell my, my department chairs. Um, my daughter loves to play with this thing. We're just going to be real, real with you here. Uh, she got these little little uh, squishy lizards for Easter, and she likes to hide them inside his, his chest cavity. So he, he's a little bit messed up right now. We'll have times to him. So he, uh, he waves hello. He survived playing with Evelyn for a while. So we're good. Okay, here we go. Here's my femur. When I am flexing my femur, this is when you raise your thigh bone, flexing my femur. So flexing the femur, pulling it up, extending the femur, putting it back down. Flexing the femur and extending the femur is just like flexing and extending the humerus. My rules are the same. So when I flex the femur, pull your whole thigh up. That's the job of the anterior muscles. When I extend the femur, that's the job of the posterior muscles. I suppose I should have put the word thigh. Apologize. Posterior thigh muscles. Same thing here with the anterior. It's anterior. I, I probably can't add that here. Thigh muscles. These are the rules. Um, like I said, do your interpretive dance, move your body, do all you can. Uh, I guess technically, so I don't forget, we can also abduct and adduct the femur. That's when we move our, our leg in or out. Not a trick question. If I want to abduct my femur, which side of, of the body are abductors going to live on? Are they going to be lateral or medial? If we're doing abduction, exactly. These are going to be the ones on the lateral side. These are going to be the ones on the medial side, lateral and medial. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, so Emily is asking about the biceps femoris muscle. She wants to know if that one flexes or extends the femur. Okay, so let's let's work through our rules here. Biceps femoris. Where do I find biceps femoris? Biceps femoris. Is that going to be anterior or posterior? Biceps femoris. Put his name down here. Biceps femoris. Okay, biceps femoris is on the femur, and it is definitely found on the backside. Biceps femoris is a backside muscle. So biceps femoris, because it is on the backside of the femur, we would say that it extends the femur. It pulls the femur backwards. But wait, there's more. Biceps femoris extends the femur what does biceps femoris do to the tibia what does biceps femoris do to the tibia yeah mary beth chimed in absolutely remember it lives on the back side which means it actually flexes the tibia so big picture idea here when you're thinking about movements of the femur versus the tibia this is always opposite. So if I live on the front side of the thigh and we're talking about what I do to the femur, that's our typical flexion and extension. If we're, I live on the front side and we're talking about what I do to the tibia, just remember it's flip-flopped. I'm gonna do the opposite because the knee joint is, is structured backwards, if you will, or opposite of, of what we do with the elbow joint, the way we normally think about the elbow. Okay, thumbs up or questions specifically about this. I am going to probably use the last bit of time that we have. I, I'm gonna pull up a skeleton and we'll do a little bit of predicting together with, with a drawn skeleton. The one thing I know that I did not um, get to, somebody asked me about the sarcomere, I apologize. Um, I didn't get to that one. If you wanna bring your question tomorrow, to um, office hours tomorrow, I, I can start off. I know it's lecture based, um, but um, bring me bring me that question tomorrow, and I'll try to take some time to talk about the sarcomere. Um, yeah, you have to think about anatomical positions that relates to the elbow. Yes, absolutely. With with all of these movements, um, will um, you definitely have to think about anatomical position because that's what it really comes down to. Absolutely. So think about anatomical position again with, with flexion and extension. It's also really helpful um, to think of flexion as it brings things together. And think about extension as it pulls things apart. That's the other way to think about them too. So um, think back to anatomical position or think about them when I contract this muscle, do my bones move closer together or do they push farther apart? So um, but yeah, you do have to remember the anterior posterior thing um, that has to do with anatomical position. Absolutely. Okay, let me pull up a skeleton and spend the last little bit of time we have here um, doing some predictions. The back. arm hey someone who's got a lab packet in front of you um help me out it was there a lab packet where the origin insertion activity showed you the whole skeleton were there any of the lab packets like that did the did the arm one so probably not the entire skeleton okay let me check out this one of the oh that's the uh the lab packet i can draw on the lab packet We'll we'll make this work i think it'll let me draw on this Okay, um, I just pulled up the, the skeleton in, in the random arms lab packet. We're not gonna do the activity the way that it's, it's written, um, but we will um, do something that's gonna help us with our predictions here. Let me check, I saw a question. Um, yes, Pilar, we would say the deltoid flexes and that it helps with reduction, correct. Okay, 
So when we we did our, our activities here, I guess I will take a peek what, what muscles we're doing. Palmaris longus. Okay. Um, when we did when we did these activities, the goal of these activities was for us to remember the difference between an origin and an insertion and being able to predict what muscles do based on where they're found. So let's remind ourselves here. When I talk about the origin of a muscle, what happens at the origin of a muscle when that muscle contracts? Do things move at the origin of a muscle? Yeah, no movements. So origin, non-moving attachment site. Attachment site, non-moving, origin. When we talk about then the insertion, by process of elimination, this is the site that moves. Moving attachment site. Moving attachment site. When I do the, the process of muscle contraction, the insertion moves toward the origin. Oop. The origin A. Um, when I do contractions, the insertion moves toward the origin. So we gave some, some specific examples of origins and insertions. The goal being to try to predict actions. So uh, we should be hopefully very used to seeing skeletons with blue markings and with green markings on them. That has been our practice. We've been doing this every single week. By the way, if you've been skipping this activity in your lab packets up until this point, today is the day of reckoning and you need to go home and do all of them because I promise you it will pay off on the final exam that we've done these activities. Because I, I, I think I've told you this pretty much every week, I'm gonna give you completely bogus made up muscles and ask you what those muscles do. So the only way we can do that is practicing using these pictures to figure out what they do. Oh, don't worry, Eileen, we're not, we're, we're not being mean. It, it, we're giving you bogus made up muscles because um, in the off chance that I know none of you guys are going to cheat, right? We're we're honor code. We're we're giving this our all. But if if I have somebody that just they think it's a good idea to cheat, um, I give them a bogus made up muscle, and guess what? You can't cheat on that one. So um, we're I, I I appreciate that all of you are are going to be honest and that we are are going to take seriously that we are not using resources, right? Otherwise, we fail the exam. So. Um, to do this activity, we are using real muscles, PLR, but um, when we do the activity exam, I'm not going to give you the name of the muscles. I may be tagging stuff in the same places as real muscles, but I'm not going to give you the name of the muscles. So it's, it's the same activity, just I didn't tell you, oh, by the way, we're doing palmaris longus. I just drew palmaris longus, for example. All right, let's do palmaris longus together and, and use that as, as our example. So. Palmaris longus, the origin, non-moving site of Palmaris longus, medial epicondyle of the humerus, medial, that medial word, what does medial mean? Again, I'm forgetful. Medial, yep, it means it's toward the middle. The medial epicondyle of the humerus. Okay, so we're, we're toward the middle here. We're on the humerus. Here's my humerus bone, by the way. I'll show it on this side here. The medial epicondyle is this big bump right here. If we didn't know where that was, by the way, that's kind of a, a wake-up call for us. I better make sure I know where that is. That's an important bone marking. That's my origin, the place that I attach where there is or is not movement, the origin. There is or is not movement, the origin. No movement. Okay. This is the site that when I contract, we're moving things toward. This is where they're going toward, the medial epicondyle. Okay. So the insertion, the place that does move, is the connective tissue that I find above the metacarpals. Now, this is a skeleton, right? So there's not connective tissue, the skeleton, but I can figure out where the metacarpals are. When we talk about the metacarpal bones, does anyone remember where in your body the metacarpals are? Where are the metacarpals found? Metacarpal bones. OK, 
Okay, well, we at least know they're in the hands. That's a start, okay? So here's my hands. Here in the outside, in the fingers, I have bones that my daughter actually knows the name of. All my bones that make up the fingers, what are those bones in the fingers called? The finger bones. These are the phalanges, yeah. The phalanges live out in, in the fingers. In your wrist, we have the group of bones that are called the, do you remember these ones? The little wrist bones down here, these ones are the carpals, yes. Friendly reminder, carpals each have a name. So make sure we, we've learned the names of our carpals. Uh, this was the one, I remember our, our sentence was about Sally taking Cindy home from the party in simpler times. So here's all my carpals. The metacarpals make up the palm of the hand. The metacarpals are where the phalanges meet the carpals, the metacarpals in the palm of your hand. So I'm drawing my attachment site here. It's above the metacarpals. We're just going to make a nice big green dot above the metacarpals. Okay, here's my nice big green dot. I've got, well here I'll point it out, my insertion down here. Got my origin up here. Now I'm going to play connect the dots. Ooh, that looks terrible. Man, my, my penguin skills may be improving, but my muscle skills are going real downhill. Okay. I have an, an insertion that's going to move toward my origin. How do I do prediction questions on the exam? Guess what? Right here. I can feel my insertion. I can feel my origin. I need to figure out how to get this part closer to this part. I can do this. I can get my insertion closer to my origin by bending down like this. And now is when we use those words, the special movement words, to describe what this movement is. What movement is it when, as, as Eileen mentioned, we just decreased the angle at the wrist? What, what does this muscle do? Yeah, it does flexion. Exactly. The way that we figured it out was I, I touched on myself, my insertion, and I did everything in my power to bring that insertion toward my origin because I touched on that origin on myself. That's how you do these questions. You find it on you and you do your interpretive dance and act it out. This got closer to this. Therefore, this does flexion. We decrease the angle. Let's make up some bogus muscles to show you guys that you can totally do this. Okay, first bogus muscle. We're gonna put an attachment site right here. And we're gonna put an attachment site right here. Okay, here goes the connect the dots. I'm, I'm gonna try to do a better job this time. Is it site number one or number two that's going to move when I do this contraction? Number one or number two? Number one, yes, number one's gonna move because it's green, it's my insertion. So feel on yourself. I'm not gonna show you this, I'm gonna make you guys do the interpretive dance here. Here's your insertion. You need to move it towards your origin. What is going to help? What action is going to happen when I move this insertion toward this origin? What's going to happen? Eileen's asking and I'm not answering. I'm going to make you guys hash this one out. <coughs> Here's my, you can kind of see, let me bend down a little bit. Here's my insertion. Here's my origin. They're coming closer together. My insertion is going toward my origin. Oh, I like that, Pam. That was real clever. Look at that, Pam. You all totally could have raised your arms for me. You could have clicked that button, right? Uh, when I take this, oops, let me go back out a little bit. When I take this attachment site here on the lateral side of my arm and I bring it up toward the top of my shoulder, I'm doing the process of abduction. I'm pulling it up toward the shoulder. 
So, or I'm, I'm raising my hand like Pam did, which was awesome. I like that, Pam. So this muscle, I've got an attachment site. Remember, we're on, we're on the lateral side of the body here. This is going to be a muscle that helps me with abduction, helps me to, to lift it up. Let's do another one here. Um, let's do, let's see, we'll do right here. And we'll do right here. Some more connects the dots. Any guesses on on this one? Yeah, a couple of us, a couple of us are, 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 are honing in on the first one. This would be going from a lateral to a medial. This would be adduction. And Kathleen asks, could we also say flexion? Yes, we could. That would be correct. Because here's the thing to consider with, with these movements. My skeleton is in anatomical position. So you can't see me in anatomical position, right? Start when you're trying to make a prediction in anatomical position and see, okay, if I'm bringing that origin and the insertion closer together, what might happen in anatomical position? Well, the easiest thing for me to first see is that my insertion would go toward my origin this way. But then you can also consider that your humerus, your arm bone up here, that arm bone sometimes isn't right next to your, your torso. Sometimes it's a little bit farther back. And if it's a little bit farther back, this attachment site is going to pull toward the front side of the body. So this would also be a muscle that could help me out with flexion. That would be correct. So main thing that this one, this would be an adductor, adding it together. This would also be a flexor, pulling it forward. Hey, so what if, let's see if I, I don't know if I have this. Do I have, I don't have a picture that's on the backside. Let me, let me try to find the backside really fast. That's going to be the one that has legs. Oh, this will work. Here we go. Right here. There we go. I do the exact same thing on the back side. Here's that place where we had tagged it before, right? And then I could, could tag that same place that we tagged it before on the front. Now I'm on the back side of the body. There would be two movement words I could say for, for this muscle right here. Can we figure out the two movement words that this particular muscle would do for me? Okay. Couple of us chimed in with the first one. Now that we're on the back side, this would be a muscle that could take your arm from being forward to pulling it toward the back side of the body. That would be extension. And then we're still, I've got a marking that's on, on the lateral side of the body moving toward a marking on the medial side of the body. This would be another one that does adduction, another adduction. Okay, here's my recommendation for these kinds of questions. My recommendation would be you print yourself off some pictures of, of a skeleton that's completely blank. And you go through and put some random green dots and blue dots. And maybe, you know, do this in your group me or find a couple of, of classmates to, to do this with. Put some random blue dots and some random green dots. And start trying to predict, because you're making up muscles, just like we're going to do on, on the lab final exam. We just want to figure out, can I move my skeleton that way? And if I move that way, what's the word I use for it? Flexion or extension, abduction, adduction. Um, I think those are the big ones that we had you guys predict. So flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, just like we always did in the origin insertion activities. Just start making up some muscles and send them to your friends in the group me or, or make a little study group where you guys just send chat text messages to each other. Um, the best way to prepare for these kinds of questions is just to go through and and draw some muscles and and predict what movement word you use to describe those muscles. Um, yeah, so rotation primarily for the skull. 
Um, yes, because the skull just says lateral and medial rotation. Um, the torso, we, we did talk about flexion and extension. So if you go back to, to the rectus abdominis activity, we did do flexion and extension. Um, so we would also, we could do rotation too. Um, we do flexion and extension though, as well with, with the torso. <clears throat> yes. And that, and that's correct. Eileen, I had forgotten to mention, we could also predict dorsiflexion versus plantar flexion. Those were some special movement words that, um, that we used for the foot. So here, let me put up a, a whiteboard here and, and mention this. Um, here, here's what I think you guys should try to do to help you out with, um, with studying for this activity. I'm going to put it all in caps here. Try to draw fake muscles that do each of the movements, um, you are learning ah, for the real muscles. So what I mean by that example, we drew palmaris longus, palmaris longus, right? That's a real muscle. That's a real muscle that flexes the hand. Okay. Now, instead of having a specific example being the specific bone markings of palmaris longus, where it attaches to deflection, I want you to make up your own muscle so make up your own origins and insertions that would lead to the same action. Use the rules. So we've got the, the anterior, posterior, right? Lateral, medial. Use those same rules to help you. But I want you to go through and, and make up muscles that would do each of those actions. So palmaris longus flexes the hand. Where else could I put an origin and insertion and make it flex the hand? or extensor digitorum, extends the hands. Where else could I put an origin and insertion to make it the muscle do the same thing? That's how I, I would recommend studying for, um, for the, these particular types of questions. Unfortunately, I am, um, oh yeah, there's actual muscles. For, there's over 600 muscles in the body, Carrie, so there's actual muscles for everything. You're probably not actually making something up. But it makes you feel way more creative if you say that you made it up, right? So, um, yeah, try to make something up or at least make just pre general predictions. Absolutely. I am unfortunately out of time for today. Um, what I will say is if you do still have a few lab-related questions, I'll take some time tomorrow morning to, to wrap those up. Um, please do try to do a little bit of work on lesson number 13. Um, to get you ready for tomorrow so we can talk about a little bit about the process of vision. I'm honest with you. I, I told you guys this last week. Um, special senses is a bit of a doozy. There's, there's a lot of things to learn. Um, so please do try to take a little bit of time today to start working through the process of vision. Um, we'll wrap up lab stuff tomorrow. We will do vision, um, the beginnings of vision tomorrow, and then we'll spend Wednesday doing more vision and hearing and balance and, and all that fun stuff. So I'm um, going to go ahead and stop the recording. Goodbye to my friends on the recording.